Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have none other than Caledonia Gladiators owner, Steve Timoney. He took over the BBL franchise just heading into the start of this season. It was formerly the Glasgow Rocks. There was a little bit of a controversial uh, name change, which he goes into and explains why. Um, and then previous to that was, was owning the WBBL franchise already. Now, his story is super fascinating. Um, he built up a lot of personal wealth uh, through his company, Smart Metering Systems, SMS, which he took public. Um, and as a result of that is now sort of, this is his legacy project, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, we, we saw the Gladiators win the BBL trophy at a weekend on the buzzer. If you haven't seen that clip, make sure you go and check it out. Um, but then more importantly, uh, we saw that they've announced a £20 million facility project uh, where they will be building a 6,000-seat arena along with um, a practice facility, five-court practice facility, um, a sports academy on site, uh, sort of state-of-the-art, state of the state of the art, world-class um, venue, which, yeah, I mean, is super fascinating. And so to, to get him on the show and kind of talk about the business side of things, what made him um, take over the franchise, what he has seen, what he has done, what he's trying to do, um, was super interesting and also a breath of fresh air, uh, to be honest. I mean, it's very rare that we hear um, such a player-centered uh, focus, which is great. Obviously, that's that's what we need. Um, but also just recognize the importance and the value of, of British basketball, uh, having that ambition that Unfortunately, the sport lacks um, at times, but the you know the ambition is sky high, and he is very much aligned with seven 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 in the aspiration that the BBL becomes the second best league in the world outside of the NBA. Um, so yeah, have a listen. Um, let me know what you think. As always, before we get into the show, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account. Uh, that's at patreon.com forward slash hoops, P-A-T-I-E-O-N.com forward slash H-O-O-P-S-F-I-X. There you can sign up to give us a monthly or annual contribution for as much or as you, little as you'd like. Uh, it goes a long way in helping us do the work that we're doing. So for the price of a cup of coffee, uh, you can help support and grow the game uh, through Hoops Fix. So check it out, patreon.com forward slash hoops fix. As always, I would love to know what you think. Um, you can drop a comment on YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube. If you are listening, uh, please drop me an email, sam at hoopsfix.com if you like some one-on-one interaction or you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at Hoops Fix. Anyway, that is enough from me. Uh, here is this week's show with Caledonia Gladiators owner Steve Timoney. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for inviting me on. Looking forward to it. So, um, as I was just saying before we were recording, like, you know, I'm, I've become increasingly interested and fascinated by the business of, of basketball and the business of British basketball. Um, you obviously come from an esteemed business background, so I think there's a ton of interesting stuff to get into. Um, and I would like to start with just how you first got involved with basketball. Like, what was it about basketball that kind of got you involved? It's interesting because a lot of people think we just kind of stumbled upon it as one of these people looking for something to do kind of thing, but... In actual fact, we've been involved in uh, ladies' basketball for 17 years. Lisa, uh, one of our good friends, got us involved as sponsors with Lady Rocks way, way back. And we've been sponsors with Lady Rocks for uh, a very long time, nearly 17 years. And it's interesting, that's the foundation for not just our interest in basketball, but uh, the reason we're here at all, because uh, they, they had award ceremonies, as you might well imagine, every year. Very, very successful club uh, from a basketball point of view. So we had very good awards ceremonies. And uh, one of the things I used to marvel at, because when you come from business like I done, a lot of business boils right down to whether or not you can develop a good, strong, productive team for the people you're working with. It's really about people at the end of the day. And I used to sit at that awards ceremony and marvel at just what kind of team they were. You know, as a team of girls playing basketball, they cared for each other, they loved each other, they worked on the court for each other, they, they were passionate about their craft. And uh, they had a strap line, they still have it to this day, our team is everything. And uh, I stood up foolishly at one award ceremony as I was giving out awards and said, what What if just for one year uh, your tagline changed it, our dream is everything? And and really what I was asking was, I guess I was a wee bit bored with just being a sponsor. <laughs> you know, the minibus and the shirts and all that kind of usual stuff. But I wanted to just explore what would come out of their heads. And uh, I, I, honestly thought, I honestly thought they would say, yeah, well, with the great year, why don't you take us all to Florida and we'll play Orlando Magic's junior women or something and we'll get the experience of being in the kind of the big leagues and uh, we'll take it from there. And uh, unfortunately, COVID got in the way and we all got locked down for two years and uh, that gave them way too much time to think about it. 
So when they came back, they said, well, actually, one of the issues we've always had is we build this great community of basketball women from young girls for under 10s, under 8s, under 10s, all the way up to senior women. But when they get up to the under 18s, they leave and go elsewhere because there's nothing for them to do here. You know, they go abroad, they go to Europe and all that. And if you look at Erin McGarrickham, who's our team captain in the WBBL side, that's exactly what she did. She was good enough to be a professional. She had to go off and become a professional elsewhere. And so they said we'd like to put a professional element to our top air pathway. And we went along to speak to Basketball Scotland to... I thought that was unusual. Basketball Scotland owned the franchise for the WBBL side, but it was something to do with the legacy of the Commonwealth Games. And for me, it seemed a very unnatural place for a franchise to sit was with the governing body. And so we went along and explained our vision to them and said, look, we'd like to have a professional women's team in Scotland. And they were more than happy to help us accommodate that. And so we, we took over the franchise that at that time was called Caledonia Pride. We brought it through to Glasgow. Uh, and we called it Caledonia Gladiators, and, and uh, there's a reason why we called it Cal Caledonia Gladiators. Uh, it was always my, it was always a case that we, I wanted to be kind of Scottish, and so Caledonia is the ancient word for Scotland, and uh, I wanted Gladiators because the original founder of the Lady Rocks, a chap called Jim Lay, had died suddenly and we lost him, and uh, I wanted to tip the hat to him and, and just say, actually, the dream that you had for the professional side uh, we are going to try to deliver, and so I called it Caledonia Gladiators. Uh, and then, strangely, I just thought it was the right thing to do, to go and speak to Duncan Smiley, the owner of Glasgow Rocks, and say, hey, we own the professional women's team, you own the professional men's team, let's get to know each other. And in a very short order, he came round to, what are your plans for the team? And we told him we're looking for a home for the team. It was prior to his getting a site at Playsport, but we told him what kind of home we wanted. And very quickly said he interested in buying the men's team because that, that seems to be a better plan than I've got for it, if you like. Uh, and we brought Glasgow Rocks on board. And I realised very quickly, it felt a bit foolish at the time, but I think it's the right decision, uh, that we couldn't run two brands. And so we just we, we sat in an office one day, we took views from everybody in the organisation and decided we'd just call the whole club Caledonia Gladiators. And to this day, I think that's a great thing that's happened, although... There's still some fans that don't particularly enjoy the name change, but you know, I didn't think much of it at the time, to be honest. Glasgow Rocks, probably my naivety, as Glasgow Rocks had five or six names before that, and people seem to be more passionate. And maybe that's my inexperience coming into a sports team. You know, what's in a name? I just thought, oh, doing the right thing. Now, I think it's, uh, it's it's set us up nicely for what we're going to do with the team because it is the only Scottish franchise now that's got both a men and a women's team. So the only Scottish professional basketball team we can reach out to the whole of Scotland. And the Gladiators not only tips the link to my friend that we lost, but also gives us that opportunity to create a whole gladiatorial spirit round about the way we play our basketball. And, you know, basketball is all about entertainment. And uh, at the end of the day, you need to put on a good game day experience. And uh, I just love what it stands for now. You know, it seems to be well accepted by the vast majority of fans and they're enjoying the whole gladiatorial thing. And we call it the Gladiator Way. It's a thing in here that we do things a gladiator way. So that's our kind of background to how we get into basketball. We didn't just turn up one day. We've been looking at women's basketball for 17 years. We're relative rookies. This is a rookie year as owners of a professional men's side, and I'm still trying to understand that. I mean, for me, the most difficult thing, to be honest, Sam, is that, as you've seen in some of the things I've appeared in, I'm, I'm five foot six, and when you stand next to Patrick Tappy and Kieran Nachara, I look as if somebody's deliberately shrunk me on a, on a Photoshop thing. It's ridiculous that I'm in amongst the land of the Giants. That's my life now. I never thought I'd ever work with people that were twice the size of me, but that seems to be my life now. <laughs> well, at least that's a smaller problem than you could have. So uh, if that's the biggest yeah. issue, then, then you're doing all right. Yeah, um, I think so. I'll get a milk crate and carry it about me, and I'll just stand in the milk crate. <laughs> <laughs> and so... so in terms of just just context for people like your your business background like what the business was that you got originally got involved with as a sponsor was that through the smart metering systems the sms yeah i mean my, my life my career my entire business life was based in uh, the gas business actually rather than just the sort of wider uh, energy business i started off as a young engineer with british gas which is about the best place you could start off as a young engineer because british gas if it was nothing else was a tremendous place to educate you as an engineer. They put their life and so on to be turning out good engineers. And uh, I left after, ooh, I think, 13 years with British Gas because I just wanted to do something else. And I went to work for Shell to sell gas for Shell. And uh, that was a baptism of fire because when you come out of British Gas, there's no such thing as competition. <laughs> you get into Shell and suddenly you're in the hard-edged, hard-nosed business. 
Uh, and that was experience I needed to set me up for what I then went on to do. And I started what used to be called Eco European and, and subsequently called, be called SMS PLC, uh, really carrying out services for some of the big gas companies and laterally metering for some of the bigger gas companies. And we decided to change the face of smart metering in the UK. It didn't really in, in exist in a competitive way. And we created competition for gas metering in the UK. Uh, and that set us up nicely to grow the company. And in, in 2011, I did the, the opportunity to take it to the market, to the stock exchange, and listed it. And uh, it's been a raging, a raging success story since then. You know, it's been one of the fastest growing Scottish businesses ever. It's a tremendous leading edge company even now, and continues to to lead the way in sort of green energy solutions along the smart metering side, both in gas and and electricity. And now electric vehicle charging and uh, grid scale batteries to help the grid deal with the, the increase in demand for electric vehicles. So it's something I'm fiercely proud of. I started it from my attic loft in 1996. I actually fell through the hole in the loft, the, the hatch in the loft at one point. And that's a story for another time and broke my ribs. But uh, I started it in my loft. I started the, the metering business in 2004. I floated it in 2011. I've continued to remain a, a significant owner of that business and it's what funds everything we do now. But the greatest thing about it is that I've been able to get involved in basketball, which after the weekend, particularly, is one of the greatest things I've ever done. It's, it's just a tremendous thing. And people ask me all the time, what, what do you get in basketball when owning a sports club that you don't get in a long business career I've had? And it's that uh, adrenaline pumping few seconds, every few seconds at the side of that court when you're either close to defeat or close to a famous victory. And it takes years off your life, I have to say, but it's a tremendous thing to experience. I never really experienced it before in my entire life that, to that level. But it's a tremendous thing to experience. I'm just glad my business career was successful enough to be able to fund stuff like this. And, and Alison and I now see this as a legacy project. We're doing it for more than... Well, we're not doing it to, to earn from it. We're doing it to uh, something we can look back in as a legacy that we made a difference to British basketball in Scotland and we made a difference to Scottish communities and gave all these youngsters a chance to, to really pursue a career in basketball, whether it's playing basketball or being a physio or being a team manager or or whether we just affect them and create better individuals and they go off and do something else with their life, that's really what we're all about here. It's it's, it's bigger than basketball, as we like to call it. The aim is to change lives and set them on a path of success, whatever that happens to be, and using the power of basketball to do that, which I do think basketball is the most powerful sport to do that kind of thing. Oh, I was going to say that um, in your interview with the Sunday Times, the, the quote that you said was, if, if you want to turn a large fortune... Uh, into a small fortune by a, by a football team or any other sports club for that matter. Um, you yeah. Know, yeah, go on. <laughs> well, I think I says that wouldn't be the case here. You know, the interesting thing is when we say it's a legacy project, people think uh, they're just going to come in and throw their money at it and not really do anything with it. Uh, I've said to the team here that, that when we say a legacy project, this will be the best run enterprise anywhere. It'll be as well run as SMS and every other business we're involved in. Uh, because for us... To leave it as a legacy project has to be first and foremost sustainable. And so getting it to a point where it can survive without us is a real aim here so that it can survive beyond our tenure on, on earth, if you like. Uh, and so there's never going to be any danger that we lose our fortune on this for a start. I mean, we're, we're comfortable within our means, let me say, but the focus is very much to make it sustainable so that whoever we leave it to, you know, we, we don't describe ourselves as owners of the club, but it's like, Describe ourselves as custodians of the club, we look after it for the next generation. But our job is to make sure it's self sustainable and successful because we've set it up in the proper way. It's a very efficiently run organisation. We're sensible about budgets, we're sensible about players, we're sensible about, sensible about expenditure uh, so that beyond our tenure it continues to thrive. And I hope, you know, in 100 or 200 years, Caledonia Gladiators are still here and, and maybe one of the world forces in basketball because we have done the groundwork at the start. So it's not a flash in the pan. It's not something that will ever run into financial difficulty because we're not setting up. And you'll recognise a lot of people say, you know, Steve Timoney's in, they're going to buy a couple of NBA players, a couple of Sam, De Sam Deckers and get on with it. Really, that's what, you know, if you're ego-driven, that's what you do. You come in, you spend your money, you make yourself look good. We've been quietly working behind the scenes to make sure this is a place where top people like Sam Decker would come and see that we've set up an infrastructure that values them as elite athletes and, and supports them and giving their best performance on the court. And so we do things quietly behind the scenes, but they're meaningful. And at the point where we've got that right, that's when we'll start, start to bring in the, the bigger and better players because we'll come here saying, 
not saying what am I coming to here? They come here saying, "Wow, this is an amazing setup." Never, never thought that would be the case. This is tremendous, and somewhere that they'll then say, "I want to stay for a few years." I mean, one of the key objectives I've got here is when I come in at first, and you'll know all this, Sam. But when I come in at first, people mentioned the word seasonal contracts. I mean, I said, "What? What's a seasonal contract?" Yeah, the last buzz on the last game, their contracts end, they all disappear. I said, "So, so who do I have off season? Then where's my players off? You don't have any players off season. You need to sign them up again." That's just ridiculous. I need players off season because. It's when we're out of season, they could go to partners, they could go to schools, they can work with the community, we can start to build the team and talk about the strategy for the following year, we could train together, we can bond together. And so the first thing we've done is get rid of seasonal contracts and, and we don't do seasonal contracts at this club. It's minimum 12 months and for the players that will want to stay in the long term, we're signing them up for two or three years. And a lot, I know a lot of the other clubs are saying, Steve, you're, you're signing them up for a summer period where we get no income because we don't have a, anything happening this summer. Uh, I come at it from a different angle. I sign them up for the summer period now, create income. And we're already having chats with the BBL and chats with Basketball Scotland about running a competitive 3x3 kind of setup. But even if I didn't have something to earn my income, I could build with my partners, I could build with my communities, I could do a lot of the stuff that will ultimately generate income through ticket sales and season ticket sales and partnership sponsorship. So I, I look at it differently, you know. I've got I've got most of my team now for the summer summer season the summer off season and we'll put them to work building uh, all the other interests in the club but you just don't get time to do in season you know when you're in season you're going game to game and you don't have much time to do anything so that's kind of the way we come at it so no we're not going to lose our fortune on this <laughs> so um when when you you know had had the opportunity <clears throat> i guess not not just for the for the men's club but the women's club as well to kind of you know do the due diligence and look under the hood of like how the business is operating and you know, you're coming in with with sort of your knowledge, your background. What would you say were the were the biggest things that stood out? Where like, you know, this is an issue, or this needs to be changed. This is an easy win for us to, you know, get the numbers to work a little bit better. Like, kind of, what were the biggest standouts? Well, we we have a term called marginal gains, which is, I think, the way I mean. I, I guess people see us as a bit disruptive or disruptors, but we're not really. We're just coming at it from a business angle. And, and so when we come in at first. Uh, we looked at how the teams were travelling, for example, and they were travelling in many buses and coaches with tight tables and they stopped at service stations and they got let off for an hour and a half to get something to eat and they came back on. And we just looked at that and thought, well, I used to always have a saying in SMS, which is your most valuable assets are the right people and they, and they leave your office at five, six o'clock and they come back at eight, nine o'clock the next day and in between times you're kind of exposed because you don't know if they're ever going to come back. And so if you look at our players, men and women, as being our most valuable asset, then you've got to make sure they feel that they're being valued. And so the very first thing we changed was we said, you can't send six foot ten athletes on a cramped minibus anywhere and then expect them to get off the bus. I think one of the first away games they done was they went down in the minibus, they got off the minibus after seven hours and an hour practice and went straight into playing London Lions. And strangely enough, Against all our better judgment, always beat, almost beat London Lions that very first game. So that was a bit of a mystery. I thought, well, they must be ill prepared, but they had a great. Maybe I've got this all wrong, you know. So the first thing we done was we we hired team coaches from parts of Hamilton who do all this big sports teams, Celtic Rangers up here, etc. They're huge buses with tables. They've got full kitchens in them, and of course we own Trust Basket Castle Hotel, five star hotel, and we got one of our chefs and said, right, we want you to cook the the food for the team. And now they travel down to these games, if necessary, the night before the game, so they're well rested up. We always get them in hotels where they've got saunas and facilities so these athletes could go and, you know, look after their bodies and relax a wee bit. Uh, and, the, and they go with a whole host of food that's pre-cooked for them and ready to prepare so that we know how much protein they're getting, how much carbs they're getting and the right nutrients and the right nutrient balance, and they travel and eat on the bus so they don't stop at service stations and go and eat the kind of junk that they serve at service stations. So we control that, and uh, those marginal gains, we think, are quite good because one of the early bits of feedback I got is when the teams step on and off the bus, the steam, they step on and off of their chests out because it feels as if, wow, we're really being treated well here. And so that was one of the first things. We call it marginal gains. Is it really going to give us a better away game performance? Marginally better than last year in many cases, but it takes a while for those marginal gains to come through. So we'll persist with it. You know, they'll, they'll go down the team buses to good to the night before, they'll get fed before and after. And we extend that now to the home games. They get they get fed before the home games and fed after the home games to make sure we're getting the nutrients right. 
But there's other things. If you look league wide, not having our own arena was, I can't tell you how annoyed I've been uh, as we've went through the season and just how limiting that is. And there's no doubt the Emirates is a good venue, the Lagoon is a good venue for hosting a basketball game. But if you've got no control over the game day experience, no control over the food and beverage, you can't do hospitality. Uh, we've got a two-hour window for training, which for a professional team is diabolical, you know. If, if Gareth or, or Miguel decides he wants to run his team for another hour because they've not practiced particularly hard or they didn't do what they were supposed to do the day before, they don't have that ability. They have a two-hour window and that's it. Off you go home, guys, into the gymnasium, whatever, they can't train anymore. And there's a million things I could list, you know, selling season tickets when really we get bounced out of the Emirates several times because there's a running club in at the Emirates or there's a badminton club in at the Emirates and this is Scotland's only professional basketball team. And I could not get my head around the Emirates saying, oh, you can't practice today, guys, you need to go to the Kelvin Hall because we've got a junior running club in. It's bonkers. And, and so I, I kind of bordering on losing my temper a couple of times, we just decided after we'd managed to buy a play sport that we were going to have our own arena for this season coming. And you've probably seen the press where we're putting a temporary arena in with uh, 1,650, I think, to 1,800 seats ahead of putting a big 6,000 seat arena in because I need to take control of that. Mm. Uh, and then you look at stuff like the contracts. The player environment, I think, is all wrong. Uh, people tell me that's the way the BBL is and that's what players expect. I wouldn't accept seasonal contracts. I wouldn't accept going for season to season with a new team. I wouldn't accept that they have to do a seven-game probation and be told in game six that they're not going to stay. I wouldn't accept that if they go down injured that you can send them home in the next plane because they're injured. Because if I'm asking a player, a professional athlete, to risk his limb, to go down for a loose ball, to win us a playoff finals or a trophy final like we did at the weekend there, if I'm asking a player to do that, and he knows in his contract it says if I break my wrist or I sprain my ankle, that I can dismiss him because the contract allows us to do that. I don't think that's right. I think if I'm going to ask a player to commit his body and soul to us, I've got to commit to him that if he gets injured, I'll rehabilitate him. That there won't be a seven-game probation, because the reason there is a seven-game probation, in my view, is because we don't do our work beforehand to make sure that player's a good player for the team. You know, We know we could get rid of him. So have we done our homework to see if he was a good player for the team? Not really, but hey, we could get rid of him anyway. So let him come in, he runs about, he doesn't fit the team and you let him go. That's not the way to treat professional athletes. We've got to do our homework and our scouting beforehand to say this is a good fit for the, the team. Uh, and, and he comes in knowing that when he comes here and goes on the court for the first time, that he's going to be here and he's going to get rehabilitated and he's not going to be dismissed just because we got the, got the work wrong. And like I've said to all my team here, if you bring a player here that's not the player that you thought he was going to be, that's because you've not done your homework. So to be fair to that player, when you take him at the beginning of the season and seven games later, you tell him he's got... Where, where does he go to after seven games? He's already missed the window of going to sign for other teams. And so I wouldn't accept that. So we're changing that. People might think I'm a bit mad for changing that, but what I'll get out at the end of it is people will come here and say, this is a club that treat you right, that look after you as a professional athlete, and that honour the bond we have that is if you give everything for me... I'll give everything for you and you won't get dismissed if you're injured. Unless it's a season or a career-ending injury then, and we just agree that we can't keep you and you have to go home and recover. You know, if you go on your ankle, we'll rehabilitate you. Here's all the resources we've got to make sure you're back on the court again. And that's the kind of big things that we changed. And uh, that may mean that it's a bit more expensive for me to put a team on the court than some other teams. But I believe that by taking that stance that every other BBL club will have to follow because players will go to their clubs and say, actually, I'm just going to go and sign for Caledonia Gladiators because you're not looking after me, and they are. And if a team's got ambition, they're going to have to do the same thing. I think if you view, like I said at the outset, that your players, the right players for this club are your most valuable asset, then come on, let's start looking after them like they are your most valuable asset. Otherwise, what are we doing here? We can't claim to be a professional club. You can say what you want. It's your actions that determine whether you're a professional club, and that's what we're doing here. Hey, hey. It's good to, good to hear stuff like that for sure. Um, you, you mentioned the facility there. You know, we saw we saw the announcement. Uh, you know, the big picture vision is a is a was it twenty million six thousand seat um, facility with a an arena with a tra training facility next to it with potential sort of options for academy. Can you kind of talk a little bit more about sort of the vision for the the, the big arena? Yeah, I mean, when we set about our plans for this, we were lucky enough to 
the, the site we're building at play sport was it's kind of funny we sat around dinner one day and four of us and said okay i, I kind of do think of the basis we want to try something so i'll say okay what's the optimum place we can do this at what's the kind of middle of the road place and what's the place we wouldn't want to be and so out of that conversation somebody mentioned well if you wanted the absolute perfect place to have an arena with the play sport and east Bright, and we kind of brushed over it and thought well that's privately owned we don't know anything about play sport we know what it is everybody knows what it is and after after talking about that the next day we sent lisa palombo up to up to uh, find out about it and we've got a funny story that they told us afterwards that, is that lisa phoned us and i think we were in spain at the time and said i'm up here at play sport steve there's two big empty sheds that, that would create a big arena space but it's going to cost too much to set out to be honest with you and they, they only give us a 10 years lease and I says, okay, so you don't think that works? She says, no. I says, ask them if they'll sell the two sheds. And she said to the chap that was standing there, the sales agent, would you sell the two sheds so that we could at least invest long term in it? And they said, yeah, hold on a minute. And he phoned his client and says, no, we won't, we won't sell a part of the site. And I says, okay, so we can't rent the sheds, we can't buy the sheds. No, I says, ask him if he'll sell play sport. And she says, what? I says, ask him if he'll sell play sport. She says, Steve, Steve, play sports a 100-acre site with golf courses and all that on it. I says, I know, just ask him anyway, ask him. And she said to the chap, would you sell play sport? And he said, pardon me? She said, would you sell play sport? I says, who are you talking to? <laughs> and she says, I can't tell you who I'm talking to, but would you sell play sport? He says, well, I'll have to phone my client. And over the next few days, he phoned his client. He says, well, if you are serious and you can prove you've got the finances, then we'll talk to you. And four weeks later, we bought... Playsport, which is a 100-acre site with a nine-hole golf course. It's got a golf academy, a soccer academy, a swimming academy. It's got big children's play areas, but critically, it had 84,000 square foot of internal space. And uh, four weeks later, we bought that site in its entirety. And that started this ambitious dream is when we sat with the basketball people and said, OK, if we were going to do something absolutely amazing, what would it be? And they came up with the 6,000 arena was 6,000 for two reasons. One is it would allow us to access pretty much all what European basketball demands of you. And the second thing was that at 6,000, it fills a nice gap in the Scottish landscape for gigs. Because if you if you want to gig in Scotland, you can have 2,000 at the SECC or Barland or 14,000 at the Hydro, but there's nothing in between. And if you, if you get into that discussion, you know that artists you really have to activate a a venue as cheap as possible so they can make as much money as possible. So we talked to the promoters and they said, yeah, if you, if you had a 6,000 seat arena, we could do 30 gigs a year there. And we thought, okay, there's income for the club. Uh, we talked to our own hotel people and they said, we can bring international conferences, events to that space. And we thought, okay, that's another income stream for the club. Uh, and then we started talking about academy. And really my vision here was, if you've got a daughter or a son that wants to become a great world-class dancer, then they go to the top school in New York or the top school in London. And I thought, well, is, is it mad if I think that this would be the top academy in the world for learning how to be a great basketballer? And he says, no, but to do that, you would really need something of an extensive practice court facility. And so we looked at the play sports site and thought, well, actually, we can build a five-court practice court facility with all the bells and whistles, with its own catering, with its own changing rooms and, as we call it, accommodation. And that would be separate from the big arena. And so if the big arena was being used for a gig or a concert, we'd still have all the practice facility. And we then said that to overcome all the worries I had about using rented space like the Emirates and the Lagoon, that the basketball had to be the top of the food chain is what, the way I describe it. In other words, they never get displaced for any other gig. So we put the basketball men and women's games in first. And everything else follows on from that. And that's the commitment I've given them. It doesn't matter who turns up. If Elton John turned up tomorrow and said, I'd like to rent your court, I'd say, wait till I look at the basketball diary. That's the bottom line. And that's the commitment I've given to them. It's first and foremost a basketball facility. And so what we'll have here is a 6,000-seater, all bells and whistle, FIBA-approved arena so that we can bring everything basketball and not just basketball. Actually, we're having discussions with netball, with gymnastics, with badminton, with all these kind of people to bring their finals here and that's tremendous but we'll also have a five uh, court academy that we think if we bring coaches in from all across the world from maybe the g leagues in america or from the, the european leagues that we can staff it up with people that are world class at their game and not only will we take british talent and take them through the the pathway and the academy but 
we'll build ourselves to such, in such a way that European kids will come here, that American kids will come here uh, to learn how to play basketball and to learn how to get involved in basketball. And that's essentially what we're doing. And, and we thought to do that right, we'd take about £20 million. Uh, we're willing to invest £20 million to make it happen because, like I say, it, it, it's not just to build an arena, a basketball arena, it's to build something that I actually think will be one of the best examples of a sports, basketball-centric, but sports-enabled facilities in the world. Because, of course, we're going to add accommodation onto the site so you can bring 200 kids here in the summer. Uh, and, and with that facility, we can run summer camps, not just for basketball, but for golf, for football, for swimming, for badminton, for tennis. Uh, and and that, that aligns nicely with our own top coaches who believe that we shouldn't specialise the kids, specialise the kids too early, you know. To get the best basketballers, you want to start specialising at 14, 16, so that they develop their, their motor skills and their hand-eye coordination across a number of sports. Mm. And so we begin with that philosophy to build what will be, I think, one definitely one of the finest academies in Europe. And we've got the space to do it here at an amazing site. So it, it's exciting. It's exciting what we can do here. I think that the unique thing about this site is that if you look around even the other BBL sites, they're all basketball arenas that they use for other things. This is already a sporting centre for five or six different sports where basketball and the gladiators are going to be the anchor. It's going to be the anchor at this site. They'll be the anchor tenant, if you like. The anchor, they'll own their own arena yeah. and so on and so forth and will develop first-class hospitality and all the kind of things that go with it. You know? So, you know, when we talk about the, the 20 million that's going to cost, is that coming directly out of your own personal wealth or is it a case of a portion of your, from your own or then, then you get a mortgage or you bring in other pots of money from other investors? Like, how do you actually finance something like that? Well, it may be naive uh, or it may be a stroke of genius, but <laughs> the trouble is when you take money off anybody else, Sam, that it comes with conditions. And the, the bank conditions are they take, a, they take a charge over the arena and they'll repossess it if, uh, if you don't pay your bills. The trouble with government funding is usually there are uh, conditions round about it that limits, you know, that will limit your ability to trade commercially. You know, ah, we'll give you the money for the arena, but it mustn't ever go into the team, and you've got to demonstrate that there's a barrier between the facility and its earnings and the team. And you're just thinking, you know, to survive in this world, you've got to be commercially flexible. So we've taken a decision. Uh, now I say this cautiously because if somebody comes along and says, oh, "Look, Steve, there's five million. Do what you want with it. I'll take it. Of yeah. course I will." But uh, at the moment, we're funding it entirely from our own resources to present to preserve that commercial flexibility. The great thing about uh, financing that yourself is nobody can say to you, "You can't do that" or "You can't do this." That means we've got absolute flexibility in looking at how we generate income for the team and for the club, I should say, rather than the team. Uh, and how we channel it, because I know I know having spoke to a lot of the other BBL owners, they've got a different structure for the ownership of the arena. Even the ones that own their own arena actually have separated the ownership of the arena from the ownership of the team, and trying to get money between the two is a, a logistical nightmare. And we won't have that, you know. Whatever money we earn for the arena, they could spend on what they sense what to spend on to make the team, like I've said, one of the greatest teams that ever come out of this country, and a, a tour de force in Europe. And to do that, you've got to give them flexibility. So it will, at this stage, come out of our own resources, uh, and that's the reason for it. It's not that we've been bold mm. or we've been arrogant. It's just that we need to have commercial flexibility uh, to make sure that we can do what we need. And then when you talk about um, you know, the business model, and you've you sort of been speaking about uh, how important it is to, to create a sustainable entity, right? You know, when, you, when you look at the money that you're going to be spending, you're already 20 million down. Is that does that become a write off on the balance sheet because that's you know your your startup costs or whatever or like how how does that work like do you, do you envision a situation where you know within three to five years or, or I don't know what the time scale is you will actually be profitable including that initial um, outlay of what you're investing into the arena? Yeah, and it's an interesting question, Sam, because a lot of people think who is this mad guy Timony with his wife Alison investing twenty million in British basketball and a Scottish team? <laughs> what is that all about? People, people say that about our hotel because our hotel's now skirts of Glasgow and it's a five-star hotel. You've got to look at why we decide, you know, we're, we're experienced business people. We don't spend £20 million without knowing what we're doing, to be honest. Uh, but really, the, what that £20 million asset does is generate income across 25 or 30 gigs a year, across international conferences and international exhibitions, across 40 home games a year between the two teams across all the hires that go out to other sports to play their finals here, 
perhaps because you know one of our ambitions is to build something that Team GB might want to reallocate to because it will be a proper academy where Team GB could actually use it as a platform to become a, a great force in world basketball. Because at the moment, they're, as you know, they scrape about looking for facilities and don't really have the investment that goes into them. We're trying to change that as well. But we're kind of saying to government, we'll put 20 million in. Where, where, when are you going to put your hand in your pocket? And we describe it as we'll finance a train. You need to build the tracks. You know, that's government level spending. But actually, it, it doesn't make sense if you put 20 million into a basketball arena and that's all it's been used for. That doesn't make any sense at all. You'd never get your money back. But when you look at what we're doing from a business plan point of view and how we generate interest and income, uh, it's a great investment for us. It, it, you know, it won't be a five-year payback. There's no, there's no point in pretending it will be. A five-year payback's the stuff that you might dream of that's never a reality. It'll be a 15 or 20-year payback. But we did say this is a legacy project. I'm 58 at the moment, so uh, God willing, I'm not about to, to croak it any time soon. Uh, but we intend to keep this in our family long be on our 10 years. So the great thing about doing that and not building it to sell to somebody else is that you can take a very long-term view and it'll probably pay us back realistically in 20 years' time, something like that, over the next 20 years. That's a horizon we're quite comfortable with. It's a nice place to put that kind of money over the next 20 years. But really, to be honest, Sam, is uh, if you look at what it's doing, it's not that you get the returns on it in a, in a direct relationship in a spreadsheet between what you spend and what you earn. It's the number of lives you've got an opportunity to change. And if you divide it by the number of lives you change, you know, if you change your lives of 10,000 kids, divide 20 million by 10,000, it's not a bad investment to make in each individual to change your life, is it? And we tend to think about per head. So you take 10,000 kids, you spend 20 million pounds. If you change those 10,000 lives, I think it's a damn good investment. And yeah. if we don't ever make any money off it because we've got this wrong, I don't think we'll ever regret it. But I think we've got it right. I think we've got That's it amazing. right. Amazing. When it comes to... Um your interactions with other franchises and the league, like how have you found that? Um, you know, one of the things that's been repeatedly spoken about over the years um, has obviously been the disparity between different franchises, the level of resource investment they each one's got um, and all of that. Like I kind of, I'd be interested to kind of hear your take on sort of what you've experienced coming in, um, you know, what your interactions have been with 777 as the sort of the new sort of funding body for the, for the league and the owners of the league um, and kind of where you see it moving forward into the future. Yeah, I've got, I've got a different attitude and, and really I'm trying to convince people to look at the bigger picture because w what happens is there's a real danger that people say to me, it's okay for you to say that, Steve Timney, you're, you're fabulously wealthy and uh, and we, we've grown this from a community side and we've brought it up over 25 years and we're, we've not going to make great money out of it so we've not got a, an awful lot of in reserve. But I think what you've got to say is, I said this actually to Drew Lasker when we were talking the other day, I, I feel for you guys, you've been trying to trying to dream and believe that BBL, British basketball, could be a great force for the last 25 years. And every year we do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. And you've heard people say that's the definition of madness. And I was totally inspired. In fact, the only reason we decided to buy the men's professional side and really put this kind of investment in was because 777 came in with 7 million quid in the interim. But more than that, because people look at that and say, yeah, but they'll get fed up, they'll get bored and they'll go off and do something else. And my view as well, if somebody put seven million into my business and then got bored and went off and did something else, you're in a better. You're seven million places better off than you were before they started. Where's the downside to that? The other thing, of course, was I knew from meeting Lens Ballon at seven 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 that there were serious people who really loved basketball. And when you're a businessman, you judge people when you meet them. You judge your character. And I knew these weren't, weren't people that, that were talking nonsense. I knew they were very serious business people who don't throw seven million at something just because they've got it. They're very calculated, they're very clever, they know what they're doing. Uh, but the thing I took most inspiration for was when they appointed Aaron Radden, because he is your number one draft pick for this kind of thing. There's no doubt getting Aaron Radden to say yes to something like this is a major coup. He's, he's, a, he's a real talent, he's a real visionary, he's somebody that's got a track record that is just unbelievable. You would Anybody would want his CV. And so when they brought Aaron Radden in and I met Aaron for the first time, and listen to him and talk to him, I was really inspired that this is something that people were really pushing forward. And so the thing I've said whenever I've had a ch chance to interact with other clubs is don't don't look at it as that London Lions, you've heard it said, London Lions are going to dominate and win everything. You know, see when you're in business, you want somebody else to pioneer products because being a pioneer is costly and usually doesn't deliver the return you want. 
And that's what underlines are doing. They're pushing the boat by doing everything the way everybody should be doing it. In many ways, their game day experience, their merchandise, their player signings, the way they staff up when you've met their team down there from their GM right through their coaches. These are serious people. There's no no Mickey Mouse stuff going on there. Uh, and Alison keeps nudging me and saying, look, Steve, we need to do this right. Look at the way London Lions are doing it. I mean, look at them and be inspired by them. Don't be, don't be chased off by them. Be inspired by them and say to yourself, actually, this is a time when we can turn British basketball into something super. And all I would say to those other franchise owners is you're better with 50% of something huge than 100% of something that's not really anything at all. And I used to say that when we floated our company in the stock exchange, somebody says, Steve, you own 100% of the company. After this, you own 75% of the company. Or I think it was 48% when we floated. And I says, yes, but we'll have 48% of something that's three times the size. I mean, do the maths. 48% of something three times the size is better than 100% of something that a third the size. And that's what I would say to the other franchise owners is, don't look at this as, yeah, well, we're doing all right. Yeah, these people are, you know, we have no good investment. How are we going to follow on? Go out and talk to investors. Go out and get investors believing in what, what the bigger picture is and what a, a potential these franchises have got. I mean, look at our trophy final at the weekend. If that wasn't the best of NBA-style games, anybody watching that would have to look twice and see that was a British basketball trophy final. That was a proper NBA spectacle. And that tells me that there's change in the air. And if you believe in the change and push forward the change, bring in investors if you don't have the money you know, keep a percentage of ownership, but enjoy being an owner of something that's 10 times the size, that's 10 times more interesting and is getting people oozing and excited about the power of basketball because that will give you 10 times the power to do something with your communities and 10 times the power to do the good you've been doing in the past. But sitting, sitting in the room and saying, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with this, you know, it's getting away from us. If, if you take that attitude, you're going to lose it because sooner or later you're not able to keep up and somebody will step in and, and pick it up cheaply. I mean, these people should be chatting the doors of investors and saying, why don't you get on board with this? This is spectacularly good and I'm allowing to allow you, uh, allow you to come in. And I think the good thing is, I think the figures are after we build our arena, there's probably six of the 10 BBL teams got their own arena. And that's critical mass. I always said in business, you don't need to convince everybody. You just need critical mass and the rest have to follow you along. And I think we're close to critical mass in British basketball with people that are positive and want to move forward. And... I've not had the exposure of the last 25 years in the 1990s and the 1980s of when it nearly made it. But there's change in there and, and we're not going to stop until British basketball is second only to the NBA and world basketball. And I think we've got enough people around the table that want to make that happen. And we'll be driving from the front. You know, Scotland's always get dragged along behind to London. You know, London make all the changes and Scotland get dragged along as a poor cousin. Not this time. Scotland are going to be driving the agenda forward. And interestingly... I laugh at this when I talk to, to Brett and uh, Lens that we'll have a better facility than they could possibly have. Because they're in London. <laughs> There's no land in London to build your facility out. They've got a problem. Copper Box is a nice place, but they have to have the academy elsewhere. Yeah. Everybody's Everybody down there will be jealous of their academy, but we're in it together. You know, I love the fact that London are out there. We get absolutely cuffed with London the last time we played them in the Copper Box. And my team were saying, you seem excited, Steve. I says, yeah, I'm excited because I've seen the gap. You know, sometimes you wonder how good you have to be. And I watched them teach us about defence. And uh, I said, let's get excited about it. We now know what gap, what, what's a chasm we have to cross. And let's get excited about crossing that chasm rather than depressed about how far behind we are. And I wish people were more like that because I love this basketball. It's the best thing I've ever done. I love professional basketball. Uh, I actually love being involved in the BBL. It's a, the weekend a Scottish team win a trophy in a British competition. That's unheard of. And uh, I love the excitement around about it. And I love, you know, guys like yourself who are driving the message forward and presenting this positive image. Uh, look at, just look at some of the games. It's as good as any basketball out there. There's some beautiful basketball being played. It's awareness we need to get out there. Yeah. You know, there are tens of thousands of people in this country watch the NBA. Why? <laughs> What's your own basketball? It's as good as NBA. Mad. Yeah. The, um, yeah, that that line, the 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 <clears throat> the ambition line of like, you know, we want to be the second best basketball league in the world outside of the NBA. You know, to a, to a lot of people, that just sounds ridiculous on some level. Where they just it sounds so far away from reality that they just say, you know, you're what are you smoking? Like, well, you know, how, how insane is that? Like, you know, <laughs> what, what do you say to that? And um, when when you talk about timelines for for achieving something of that scale, you know, how do you see it kind of all playing out? 
I mean, first of all, you're only limited by your own self-belief, aren't you? If you don't believe that we've already got a product that we can start to build on uh, towards setting down like the NBA, then come on, you know, why we bother doing this at all? Because we're talking about being much better in everything we do in every aspect of what we do, from an academy to the way we treat the players. I've already started making changes here. If you believe that players should be in seasonal contracts, if you believe, believe that players should not be protected against injury, if you believe they should do a seven-game probation, then go off and play somewhere else because you're, you'll never become second only at the NBA. But if you treat your professionals the way they should be treated as elite athletes, if you think of treating your fans as fans... I mean, one of my biggest frustrations this year is the way they, they messed about with the scheduling because they, they change games at a minute's notice, not thinking how it affects the fans and their babysitters and their travel arrangements and all that, and I detest that. So one of the first things I say to Lens is, you need to get the schedule out there 18 months ahead and stick to it, and nobody's allowed to change it. No gaming, no anything. You're not allowed to change it unless there's a major disaster. Because the minute you change it, you're saying to your fans, you don't, we don't really care about you. It's more convenient if we move it to 7.30 to 5 o'clock. You're forgetting that people make travel arrangements, get babysitters and so on and so forth. So if you're limited by not being able to make the small changes, then you'll never be part of something great. I think you've got to have courage to make those changes. You've got to look forward and say that if I've, got, if I've got no summer income, I'll create summer income. All of these wee changes lead you to something great, and I think that's the key thing. Time frame wise, I think the, it's in the air for the change in British basketball. People are looking at it now and saying, wow, I never realised British basketball was, was as good as that. And we know it's nowhere near where it should be. But I think in about five years' time, we're going to be on the edge of something spectacularly good. And certainly within five to ten years will be considered as second only to the NBA. I don't think that's outrageous. The greatest feature of Aaron Radden is not his vision and his talent, it's his lack of patience. <laughs> he wants everything to happen tomorrow and so do I. I always take the view that I can't take ten years, I might be dead in ten years, let's do it now. That's my whole attitude to life and, and can we do it in ten years? Tell me why we can't do it in ten years, as I would ask you. If you think there's a glass ceiling, it's because it's in your head. I get no glass ceilings. You know, we'll push through any glass ceiling. And, and when I say push through glass ceilings, it sounds grand, doesn't it? But if there's a barrier on your way, which is seasonal contracts, push through it and do, do away with seasonal contracts. Yeah. If there's a barrier on your way about investors in your club, go and get investors in your club. Yeah. If it's about affording the budget because the salary cap's been lifted, go and develop your income so you can afford to meet the salary, the new salary demands. If you want to be great, you've got to start acting in such a way that will make you great. If you don't want to act that way, then step aside and let others do it. It's like I've always said, if you don't believe you can do something great, just step aside. You're just in the way and let us go on with it. Otherwise, go on the, go on the train and, and do it with us. And that's the way I, if I say to my staff, I say to my staff all the time, don't be that person that tells me we can't do anything because we'll just set you aside. You're just in my way and let's go on with things. You know, you think about man achieves. We talk about can we make basketball great. Think about man can achieve when he puts his mind to it. My goodness. Yeah, for real. Tremendous. The um one one of the big challenges that, that British basketball has had is is cutting through in the mainstream media, you know. Um and it's interesting, like, you know, coming after after Sunday's win, I saw the the sport bible, like a you know, a big social media page posted the the game winner. And, you know, I'm I'm always interested when some of the more sort of mainstream outlets cover British basketball to kind of see what the comments are like. And you know, and I, I clicked on it, you go through the comments and you know, all of the top voted comments are like uh you know, like uh, British basketball, you know, I didn't even know we had British basketball. Or there's a few comments about the BBL name and, and sort of the, the reference to cosmetic surgery and, and all of that. Um, <laughs> you know, what's your take on like the, the challenges with getting the mainstream media to care? You know, like there's been so many attempts over the years to get them to pick up the games, to co- to do a little bit of coverage in the news section, sports news sections in the evening to get the, the papers to, to dedicate some 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 lines to it. Um, and it's just really struggled to kind of cut through like that. Like, uh, I'll be interested to kind of hear your thoughts around that and, and what can be done to help facilitate it. I feel sorry for the mainstream media. I really do because uh, they're dying. The mainstream media are dying. The way broadcasting is done is changing. The way people consume their content is changing dramatically fast. No, I don't know anybody, you know, 10 years younger than myself who reads a newspaper these days. I don't know anybody 20 years younger than myself that subscribes to the big news channels at 100 quid a month or whatever it is. And so there's two things I would say. One is that newspapers are, if they don't show newspapers, and when I say newspapers, I mean the main news stream outlets, not just newspapers, but the main news channels. If they don't address 
the fact that the youngsters amongst us now are totally different from us. You know, I, I have my Sky and my subscription, my BBC TV license and so on and so forth, the same as most guys my age. But I can't imagine my sons or daughters ever will have. They want to consume their stuff on TikTok and YouTube and so on and so forth. And so the model for consuming that's changing. They don't want to pay for anything the youngsters do. They want to see everything on YouTube for, for nothing, but the price of that is advertising and so on and so forth. But I can't, I mean, looking at this weekend, because even with the, the game that we played there and the outcome of that game, which is, I think, we'll never forget for 20 years, well, where people have, been, people have been viewing that video. I think I viewed it myself maybe a couple hundred times, at least a couple hundred times. And the only way I get away with it is Alison says to me, what are you watching? I'm just watching the game at the end again. She says, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Usually that you're told to get on with something productive. But if you look at the mainstream media, if you don't follow what your customer base wants, you're going to be dead in the water. So if you don't start talking about basketball when it's the second most particip participated sport in the UK, you're missing a massive audience. When the main audience for basketball is between 13 and 34 years old, which is the key demographic for the news outlets are not paying attention to them, they'll pay the price for it. Because these people will turn to somebody that does. And there's, there's a whole load of disruptors coming out now that are taking this content and sending it out to the Young Brigade in different ways. And those people will put the big broadcasters in a place. And I said, it's interesting, I said to one of the, I did an article early on, with, I can't remember who it was, what paper it was, and I said, are we going to get in your sports pages? And they said, probably not, but we'll see how things go and you make it your own section in the sports pages. And I talked to my PR company and they say, you don't want in the sports pages, that's old hat, nobody reads them anymore. You know, you want into the lifestyle pages, that's what people read. You want onto the YouTubes and the TikToks and the Instagrams, that's what people consume their media on. So I feel sorry for them. If, if I was in charge of a kind of mainstream media outlet, I'd have a whole team of people looking at how we can change and make the second most participated uh, sport in the UK something that features every single day because you're then guaranteeing that your readership's going to stay with you. If you don't show basketball, you're going to lose a fair percentage of the population. And by the time you realise that and you try to change it, it's too late, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's what often happens with paradigm shifts. People come at the paradigm shift too late and... When you're in business, it's all about paradigm shifts. It's watching for the trends. It's watching for the changes in behaviour and making sure you're right at the front end of that change. And the mainstream media just are not. You know, seeing it in Sport Bible is great. Seeing it in BBC and Sky News and everything is great. But uh, really, there's still a percentage of the population who are in the big news outlets that think football is everything and rugby is everything. And I see them, I see them giving a whole section to a sport that's not quoted anywhere in terms of the numbers of people that are playing it in basketball but doesn't get a look in. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased that BBC NBA uh, and in between screening one of the NBA games actually showed the end of that game because that shows that we're making breakthroughs. Yeah. You know? yeah. But I think what what move with the paradigm shifts or lose your business is, is my message to the mainstream media. When you talk about building out um the sort of the front office and the staff of, of your franchise um and your club like what do you think is the sort of the ideal team size and what are those sort of key roles that you'd be looking to fill? And I mean, out of interest, like how, how many staff do you have? Like not the coaching staff, but the actual sort of front office league uh, team staff that you have for the club at the moment? I mean, if you discount the teams and the coach, the playing side, if you discount the playing side, we've probably got yeah, 15 people at the moment. Uh, that's going to have to grow three or four times the size, to be honest, to where we are taking it because uh, we inherit those kind of you know, we inherit the people that came along with the WBBL side, we inherit the, the Glasgow Rock staff. But when you're into basketball and you look at it from a businessman, you know that some of the key areas are a director of basketball, to give it a title. It's somebody that is the interface between the basketball playing staff and the chief exec. It's, uh, it's somebody that's very senior on the commercial side to deal with partners and sponsorship income because we sell ourselves too cheap in the BBL at the moment. When I come in and see what people pay for a courtside box of his gobsmacked, was like that's we're underselling ourselves a factor of ten here, guys. So we've got a professional team and value that for us. So we need a commercial person that knows the value of those assets and could talk to bigger partners about the real value of what they get and associated with that. Uh, and of course, you, the the whole thing about basketball is it's a content and media business. So you need the very best people doing your content and media. So we have a creative director and a whole team that's building underneath them. And then you have your your normal your CFOs, your finance people to keep an eye on what people are spending and your HR people to make sure we get the contracts right and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that bit I'm comfortable with. I mean, I've run huge businesses and, and I come into that and I could see 
almost in front of my face what's missing here. Uh, but I had to start from the point of view is where are the big important areas, the sponsorship, the running of the team, the facilitation of the team. And two of the very early roles we created was team managers and Mitch Simpson and Honor Campbell come in to run them, two of the best appointments we've made. Because uh, before that, the coaches were washing the team strips and doing all that kind of stuff. And I just thought, well, I, can, I come from a background where you have to know your own value. So should a head coach who is worth you know, arguably a lot, an awful lot of money to us by watching the team strips and that's what kind of happens in the BBL. And we say, no, let's bring in a team manager and takes all that away. Let's bring in an assistant coach. Let's bring in a second assistant coach who will focus on these different areas. Then let's look at the other sides of the business. And if you look at it as a, I kind of divide it as there's a performance on the court and there's that team it's got to be looked after. There's the socials that show people what the performance on the court's also all about. And there's a the backroom staff that have to run it as a business and look after financials. So I'm guessing the staff here at this club is going to probably, if you take set the teams aside, it's probably going to be 30, 35 strong before too long. Uh, you know, my own role, I've came in almost as a, a CEO elect, but I retired 10 years ago. I've not got the energy at 58 to be a chief exec anymore. So that's a position that we're in the middle of filling uh, and we'll make announcements about soon uh, so that th those people could, could properly run the business well. I dream about where to take it, if you like. Yeah. So, but it's going to need a big organisation, but like any business, you build your organisation and you build the income to pay for that. How much operationally do you have to be involved at the moment? I'm fully involved at the moment. I mean, I have to tell you, I've worked probably 80 to 100 hours a week since we took this franchise over and I'm kind of worn out. Yeah. I was never in my previous business ever, you talk about burnout, I never ever experienced that. I always had masses of energy and I could work long, long hours and it didn't bother me. I've realised at 58 I can burn out quite quickly <laughs> and I have to go and rest for a wee bit. Mentally, I could burn out quite quickly. Uh, so I've had to be involved 80 to 100 hours. Uh, as people, as I've started to understand people's capabilities and uh, our, our people here are good at taking stuff away from me. So so Sean and Lisa will come to me and say, Steve, you don't need to deal with that, I'll deal with that. And, and they're very capable, very productive people. And so I guess over the past few months, I've went from 100 hours to 80 hours to 60 hours to 40 hours to... Now I've got an opportunity to replace myself as chief exec and and what I'll probably do after that is I'll be their biggest fan. I'll be shaping things at the top end and I'll probably pop in and out and work 20 hours a week and I think that's about the level of energy I've got left in me to be honest with us. And we've got other businesses to run. I mean, we have play sport to run. We have our hotel business to run, which incidentally are, are very key parts of what we're doing at the Gladiators because of course play sports the facility will play it and the, the hotels is going to run a lot of the income generating uh, events that we'll do for the arena. But I need to go off and make sure they're running properly and Alison's in the same boat. You know, she's she's been working 80, 100 hours a week and uh, we're starting to back off now and enjoy some downtime. All right. The, and just, just um, specifically about the sort of the Scottish basketball landscape, do you think that um, Scotland could support two professional franchises? Is that something that you'd welcome, like to have that sort of local rivalry um, in the in the BBL, WBL? I get asked this all the time, and at the, at the risk of saying like I'm scared of competition, I don't think it's a time. Uh, but we'll explain that because there's a couple of things there. One is, if you're going to build the BBL, then the first thing is, if you're going to build fan engagement, fan engagement in a lot of sports is about true rivalries, isn't it? And so I, I kind of laughed when I came in that rivalry was regarded as, you know, us playing baby shark as we got on the bus on the way down to Sheffield and taking the mick and I say that's not rivalry that's banter I say rivalry is Scotland England it's the old enemy rivalry is uh, Wales England rivalry is Ireland England rivalry is Northern Ireland Southern Ireland you know rivalry is Newcastle London that's rivalry because there's rivalries that have existed for hundreds of years for various reasons and so when you get rivalries that are real rivalries what happens is that your fans defend their turf don't they so at the moment we promote every game of Scotland, England, because every single team we play is an English team and we are Scottish. And so our fans bring the flags and bring the pipes and drums and we defend our turf like we were fighting a battle way we back in 700 years ago in the, in the fields of Bannockburn and stuff, you know. And so I put a proposal almost, not put a proposal as such, but I put a wee paper down to the BBL and said, you know, my view is this, is that you have to bring a team in from Belfast to create a Celtic rivalry. You have to bring a team in from Cardiff to create a Celtic rivalry. You have to bring a team in from Southern Ireland to create a Northern South and an additional Celtic rivalry. 
you obviously have to fill burning because it's a very obvious gap. Uh, and you have to then look at, if you're going to 16 teams, where else that might come from. And all I've said is Scotland at this stage is not important. Us having a local rival, Newcastle are, are, are our local Derby team. And at a point in time when I think we've got Scotland interested in a fanatical way in basketball, then I'll embrace another team in Scotland and help that happen. But what happens is people come in and say, the easy thing to say is, yes, there should be another team in Scotland, there should be Edinburgh. I mean, if you, it's an uneducated view if you think just because Edinburgh is a big city, that's where the next uh, basketball professional franchise should be. Because it's already been, we, you know, Glasgow Rocks as it was, was Edinburgh Rocks, and that came to Glasgow because Edinburgh won't sustain a basketball team. The reason we took the WBBL franchise from Edinburgh is because Edinburgh won't support a professional franchise. They're too steeped in rugby. It's too much of a city, a bit like London, I've said before, that I've got a London, I've got, I've got it's a very transient population. Edinburgh's one of these cities where people come and go all the time. It's very touristy, it's very transient. Whereas, I use a term that we get a nosebleed when we go to the end of our street. In, in central Scotland, we don't like moving too far from our families and so we've got a very settled population. For me, absolutely, there's room for another team in Scotland, but it's not for five or ten years until we develop this fanatical fan base in Scotland and we can't satisfy that. And for me, that should come somewhere north of Edinburgh because if you have it in Edinburgh, first of all, it's only 40 miles away from us, so the fan bases overlap and we've completely disregarded Dundee, Perth, Aberdeen, Inverness, all places where they play great basketball. For me, we really need to try to long-term build uh, interest in, in a professional basketball team somewhere like Dundee so that you capture Inverness, you capture Aberdeen, you're far enough away from us that you're not stealing our fan base and we capture Scotland and Southern Scotland and we share Edinburgh. So the only way Edinburgh is going to support a professional basketball franchise is if we share fans. You know, the fans travel to Glasgow to see us or they travel to Dundee to see them. But if you put a professional franchise in Edinburgh, it'll fail. Because mm. that's just the nature of Edinburgh. They're, they're a fanatical rugby rugby city. And anybody that tries to do anything different just gets sent sent marching. You know, rugby, rugby wins all. Uh, and that's, I think, an educated approach. I've got no issue with a long-term another team coming out of Edinburgh. One thing I would say is I'm very strong in this. We're big, big, big... Uh, supporters of the women's basketball and I've said openly and I'll say again that I don't think we can be great in, in the BBL and the men's basketball unless we take the women along with us because in, the, in this day and age when people expect uh, us to follow the trend of women's sport in general how bad would it be if a bunch of men running British basketball on the men's side didn't bother to take the women along with us so we do that at our club there's no difference between the WBBL and the BBL team they're elite athletes and they'll come along with us and play their games at the same arena and everything else. Uh, and so I'm very strong on if you're going to bring in other franchises, they must commit to both a BBL and a WBBL franchise so that we don't get out of kilter again because the BBL are 10 teams hoping to move to 16. The WBBL, I think, are 14 teams and it's a mess. The league is a mess. And no one should consider issuing a WBBL franchise to a league that's a mess because you just make the problem worse. And then you just create further separation between what the BBL are doing and the WBBL are doing. And I want to see the women playing out the big stadium, the same as the men are. Because if we believe we can do that, look at the Lionesses. They fill out stadiums. They fill 60,000 seats when they're playing. Because we do that in basketball, you're damn right we can. I expect to sell 6,000 seats for a women's game, the same as 6,000 seats for a men's game. Because we're positioned in the mind of our fans that these are elite athletes and you shouldn't be concerned about who you're coming along to see. We'll put on a tremendous game day experience. You'll see excellent basketball. Arguably, the women's game's played <coughs> below the rim and the men's game's played above the rim. But it's just as exciting basketball as, as any basketball you'll see and you'll see it in the arena with, with absolutely tremendous facilities. So for that point of view, I don't want to see the mission WBBR licences independent of BBL licences. I think we have to be coordinated about that. Perfect. And that's like bang on an hour. So I'm uh, going to wrap it up there. But yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Super inspiring. I think we're slightly out of focus on my camera. Yeah, I think you just moved closer and then it kind of it, it locked it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Like, I think that's super interesting, super inspiring as well. And, uh, you know, I've always said that I feel like thank British you. basketball has been uh, plagued by small time thinking and we need a bit more ambition in the sport. And, you know, why not? Why why can't we fill out big arenas? Why can't we have major sponsors and be, you know, within uh, sort of cut through into mainstream culture? So, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. I look forward to following the journey and seeing how it all comes together over the coming years.
Yeah, thank you, Sam. I mean, I, I love listening to people like yourself and your podcast and your various things because you believe what's possible. I believe what's possible. And anybody that doesn't believe it just needs to get on board or get off board, one of the two. But get on board and let's take this to where we believe it, its rightful places. And I want to be part of that journey, number one of the ones that's driving it, so I'm loving it.